Hello, everybody. Welcome to History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Charles Pellegrino. Pellegrino earned uh, his bachelor's in 1975 at the Long Island University and a master's degree in 1997, also at Long Island University. He then got his PhD in 1988 at the Victoria University of Wellington. Pellegrino served as a scientific consultant on James Cameron's Avatar project. The interstellar vehicles seen in the film are based on the designs of Pellegrino's and Powell's Valkyrie rockets fused with Robert L. Fowler's designs. He's written many books. And one of the books that we're going to be talking about today is The Jesus Family Tomb. The Jesus Family Tomb, he co-authored it with Simca Jacobovici, and they both worked on that site together. Okay, so welcome to uh, History Valley Podcast, Charles. Okay, so let's start off with this, the Yeshua Bar Yehosev ossuary, or uh, uh, it's Aramaic for uh, Jesus, son of Joseph. Um, when you guys looked at this tomb and you found all these ossuaries, and they seemed to match the, the biblical names, my question about that is, how confident are you that this is the tomb of Jesus? Uh, very. Uh, we went into the tomb after years after all the ossuaries were removed. It had been mm -hmm. sealed for a very long time. And uh, the ossuaries were in the Israeli Antiquities Authority warehouse. And uh, the names were interesting. And I, when I first met Simka, we had been, he had been interviewing me about something else. And he said, well, Charlie, I have something else to show you that you may be interested in. And one of the things, just as an aside, the more and more I got to know Simka, he's one of those people who can go into an archaeological site, like at Pompeii, for example, point out something, an inscription you've known about for maybe 20 years, and ask questions nobody ever asked before. It's one of the things to, when it's when I'm there and it happens, I'm like, oh man, how come I never asked that question before? Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, but other people get offended by the very same thing that I love hearing from him. Uh, if there were no other ossuary from that tomb, except the Jesus son of Joseph ossuary, it would still be utterly fascinating. That ossuary is full of chemical and biological anomalies. And by that, I mean some of them just involving what should be nematode worm remains and trails where bones had been in the material at the very bottom of the ossuary. Present in every other ossuary, insect remains that inhabit the ossuaries that are present in every other one not this one. We're missing hmm. all the products of decay. Uh, the ossuary culture is something we would know nothing about if not for the Second Testament, where it describes the tomb. It describes the body being laid on a slab in a tomb uh, somewhere near where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is today. Uh, what they did was they cleaned the body, they put <clears throat> plant material over the body and left it for a year. And about a year later, the bones and the shroud material would be collected and put into a bone box, which we call an ossuary. And the thing about the Jesus ossuary, never, never mind Jesus, son of Joseph, but the ossuary also has three crosses, one attached to the beginning of Jesus' name and two that are brought together uh, on the very top of it to form a star. You have three crosses and a star, uh, one of them being the Tau cross on the star. Uh, you not only have the name of Jesus, but you have reference to a cross and a star, the Alpha and the Omega of this prophet's human existence on this earth. The people kept saying in 2007, oh, they claim to have found the skeleton of Jesus, the bones of Jesus. Uh, 
this ossuary, a bone box, is unique in having no bones. There was no femur. There were none of the organisms that live on fragmenting and decaying bones. Uh, the only traces we have are pristine. We have trace fibers from two shrouds that at some point were removed from the ossuary. Probably at the point that the tomb was broken into at about the time of the First Crusade, which is the beginning of this period that we know chemically of this red earth, the terra rosa soil, leaking into the tomb and starting to fill it almost three feet deep. For American listeners, a little more than a meter deep. Mm. And also, uh, getting involved in the ossuaries. And uh, that happened at around the time of the First Crusade. Uh, mm. Someone removed the shrouds. The shrouds, the trace fibers we have are very unusual because this chemical process of concretion formation formed around these trace fibers, some of which were very frayed and had fallen off the shroud material. Uh, one of the shrouds was of a burlap-like material. The other, woven from flax-based linen on a loom that was very heavily contaminated by cotton. Again, not uh, by the customs of the time. Uh, it was ritually impure. The Jesus ossuary itself had been broken. There's no decoration on this ossuary, just the name and the crosses one near Jesus' name at the beginning of the name and the others on the lid. It's one of the plainest ossuaries you will ever see. Uh, interestingly, the shroud material is, it's an ossuary that would have been rejected. And in fact, part of the inscription goes through this break on the ossuary. It was being cut, it broke, and it was you know, not going to be used for anything. There's uh, this passage in the canonical gospels and also in the sayings of Thomas, of Jesus as quoted by Thomas, show me the stone that the stone cutter rejected. That is my cornerstone. So uh, th that was a moment just there that, uh, whoa, someone, if this is the same Jesus, son of Joseph, even the ossuary was reflecting what he preached. Mm. The fibers are pristine. They were never, ever in the presence of a decaying body. Three independent labs have confirmed that these anomalies are there. I can say with about a 99% certainty minimum that uh, there were that we're missing a body that with all the fury that was being vented in 2007 mostly by people who never read our reports never read the book uh, talking about a skeleton in the tomb I remember once I was on Fox News and Jerry Falwell was wagging his finger at me about the bones of Jesus and I you know it was about the third time I had said to him, no bones. We're missing a skeleton, which is what people of faith say we scientists should have been expecting to find all along. And uh, that's pretty amazing to me. I, years and years ago, I thought, you know, the Jesus story is so similar to the Dionysus story uh, that maybe it was a bit of Roman theater that just got out of control. But this tomb really shows these people existed and the ossuaries are inscribed in three languages, Latinized Aramaic with the name of Maria, just as we find on a prayer on a wall at number 11 house in Pompeii and Aramaic and Greek. And if you go to the Acts of the Apostles, and the people are all amazed that these people speak all these languages, uh, the Pentecost, and so on. 
Uh, that again echoes with this tomb. I'm a little surprised, always been a bit surprised that in a crossroads like Israel, people would be surprised that there were families or groups of people that lived together and worked together that spoke all these multiple languages. Apparently, it was not very common. And in the tombs, among inscriptions, it's the only tomb where we find not only so many inscribed ossuaries, but inscribed in these languages. And to me, the important thing about that is you had a multilingual people, a very literate people, and it goes against the common image you know, that we get during the Dark Ages that everyone was illiterate and the, the Jesus family, the apostles, they were not literate and that the Gospels were finally put to writing uh, decades and decades later. Where all the different, uh, the different inscriptions, including a prayer in an adjoining tomb that is written in Greek and expresses that these people, whoever they were in this uh, area of these tombs, they believed someone had risen up. Uh, the main thing is the Gospels probably, and I would say the four that are the canonical Gospels, and I would also say at least the uh, uh, sayings recorded by Thomas, that they were written not decades later, but as current events. They might have been edited later by other people. I don't know how to explain the miracles. Uh, so they you could have um, been made up. They could have been real. They could have been real, and even in the sense that people under great stress imagined their so you um, loved and lost. You date back. the Gospels. Do you date the Gospels shortly after Jesus was crucified in the AD thirties? In that case, uh, that that it what? I, so you date the Gospels shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus. I think they were written very shortly after the crucifixion. Oh. I think his sayings might have, many of them were probably written down by these people before the crucifixion. Hmm. And to me, the important thing is whether you believe Jesus was divine or not. And I'm very, very agnostic on all that. In fact, you know, I'm about as close as you can be to atheist and still call yourself agnostic. To me, there was someone who so hated no one that he called out asking forgiveness for those who had flogged and crucified him. And boy, if that isn't something we should be embracing as many of us as we can as maybe pointing to a lesson, maybe pointing in a direction for our own time, especially we live in a time where more and more countries are arming themselves to the teeth with terrible weapons, nuclear weapons, uh, almost that could make the uh, prophecies and parts of the book of Revelation uh, look very real. Let's take a look at what's going on in the next slide here. So we got the Yehuda bar Yeshua ossuary, Judas son of Jesus. And what I wanted to ask you is, that's an amazing one. And when you look at Roman tradition, hmm. it makes sense. And I think, for one thing, people have said, and I'll get to this in a moment, hmm. common names. Oh, it's all common names. It's just common names. Uh, Charles is a, you know, ask anyone, what's your first name? And Okay, Jacob, that's a fairly common name. What's your father's name? And then add your mother's name or your brother's name. And you find very quickly how even for common names, the mathematics of it are you just don't meet that many people with these names. Uh, I, just, you know, I had run the, uh, through basically a telephone directory and uh, or directory of all the children in all the high schools and junior high schools in New York City and the combination of names of my three kids all in the same school system at the same time not only were 
they the only ones in all of New York City with those names that were brother and sister, uh, but in all of New York State. So uh, yeah, I do believe the mathematics are pointing toward this. Now there's a lot, this is the Judas ossuary is the most controversial. Some people think, oh, what's someone trying to say? Judas is the son of Jesus, the betrayer? No, if you go to John and the Last Supper, there are two people at that dinner of the, they, who are named Judas. And there's Judas, not Iscariot, and there's Iscariot. And uh, you look at all the comparisons. This very young Judas, not Iscariot, uh, is basically an adolescent. He's probably the one who is falling asleep, leaning against uh, Jesus' shoulder in the, uh, in the Gospel of John. No, it was not the Da Vinci Code, uh, Mary Magdalene leaning against him. But the beloved disciple was, it, it makes sense that you would call him the twin of Jesus, uh, by the way, the beloved disciple, he's named as Didymos Judas Thomas. So what Didymos in Greek means twin. Tiam in Hebrew and Aramaic means twin. So he only had the beloved disciple, if his name were ever going to be written anywhere and really identified, he would be Judas or Jude. And uh, in the Catholic Bible, the Joseph Bible, they name him later as St. Jude. Uh, the, especially in the Thomas Gospels and some of the Apocrypha associated with Matthew and Philip, there are uh, one of the cornerstones, one of the pillars of faith and charity is the adoption of orphans and bringing orphans into your home, uh, just as Jesus was the adopted son of Joseph. And under here's where it really gets in the context of Roman law, because under Roman law, if you were claiming some kind of kingship and you might be hit for sedition and executed, the Romans killed your entire family. They killed husbands, wives, children, even down to the level of grandchildren. They had one quirk that no other civilization had. They allowed siblings to live. They had a second quirk, major quirk, which was a child, even an adopted child, was blood. That still goes through Italian families today. There is no difference between adoption and blood. So an adopted child could become the king or the emperor. In fact, in the time of uh, Jesus, the emperor Tiberius was Augustus' adopted son. And not very long afterward, Claudius would give the throne to his adopted son, Nero, above his own biological son, Britannicus. So it fits with what you would find on an ossuary. For one, the Romans did not like to enter tombs. And especially after what happened with the Ark of the Covenant and building future replicas of it out of not valuable stone, not having gold around it. And in Jewish tombs of the ossuary period, there was not to be one thread of gold or silver in a tomb. So they didn't have looters going into these tombs. Only there would you write the name Judah, son of Jesus. What do you make of Acts 13, 6 to 8? Um, having a mentioning some mentioning someone called Bar Jesus, son of Jesus, and later calls him uh, Elimus, the, ma uh, the magician. Do you think that's connected to this at all, or do you think that's just a coincidence? It's Un, this, it's unconnected. I haven't uh, looked at that one closely. Mm. So that's one that I just have to say, I don't know. I missed that one. Hmm. 
Okay, let's take a look at the Mary Omni Mari. Uh, and it's altar. Bar Jesus? Yeah. Son it's of Bar Jesus. Jesus. And yeah. he becomes a magician of some kind? Yeah, he gets into a conflict with Paul, apparently. Huh. I could oh. see that because some of the early Christians that we find and we have their legal records in Pompey's sister city of Herculaneum. And uh, there was the case of Justa. We have the whole court case. But these were a form of Christianity, not like what we would really recognize. They were abolitionists. And uh, Mary Emine and her brother Philip, they did, according to the Apocrypha, manage to uh, free a lot of the slaves in some area of Greece. And the Gnostic Christians, as they're sometimes called, but there seem to be uh, divisions into many different groups. I mean, somewhat the beginning of what we have now, we have all variations on Protestants, and then there's Catholics and Jehovah's Witnesses, and very many groups that came out uh, from uh, what originally began, uh, you know, what came out of Rome, out of uh, the tail end of the Roman Empire is basically the Roman Catholic Church. And then as it spread, it divided into all sorts of variations. So these people were, uh, they followed Jesus, they followed all the teachings of Jesus, but maybe even so as not to be killed outright, they did also recognize some of the, uh, more so the Egyptian deities than the Roman deities. So Isis and Osiris, for example. And in Herculaneum, they had a chapel, a very simple chapel. The room was completely white. And they, there was a kneeling altar in front of it, very similar to what Roman house altars were, but uh, much simpler and not decorated at all. And a bowl where frankincense would be burned, and above it, a cross. And as the volcano erupted, the people of that house pried this cross out of the wall and ran away with it. It was very quickly and with great force pried out of the wall. And uh, so you had different groups of Christianity and on into uh, uh, the second century AD and third century AD, you had groups of Christians actually fighting each other. There was a hell of a series of riots in Rome itself one year over fighting over what should be the proper date that we celebrate Easter. Do you think that Mary Magdalene was this Mary Omni Imari in the ossuary? I do think so, and I don't uh, think, uh, uh, getting back to Judas, beloved disciple, uh, and Judas, son of Jesus, I expect that that is an adopted child. Uh, Jesus appears to have been involved in some way with the Essenes, or at least they appear very clearly to have written about him and the pierced Messiah and so on. Uh, I'm not sure that these ossuaries mean Mary Magdalene or, or Mary Emne and Jesus were married. Uh, also, the rest of the inscription, it identifies her as Mara, which some people have said, oh, it, it's uh, another person's name, but it also can be read as the female version of the name that was given to Peter, which is the master of the congregation. And she is very important as the first witness and so on. And many of the apostles ran away. Uh, but Mary Emine, I, I think it's possible that along with Peter, she would have been what you can track back to as one of the very early masters of the congregation or popes. And it wasn't really until about A.D. 800 that they began writing women out of it and making Mary Magdalene 
going back and making her uh, the prostitute and later on the patron saint of prostitutes. That all happened many, many centuries later. But I think this person was a very, very important person, not necessarily married to Jesus, although there's all sorts of debate about that. In France, for example, they claim her as married to Jesus. And another thing about the names, we have a description of Mary Emine going back to the Jordan Valley shortly before she died. Her brother, Philip, died in another country. So we don't, you know, you wouldn't expect to find his name on an ossuary in this too. In uh, one of the apocryphal texts on John, uh, by John and the going to sleep or the death of uh, Mary, Maria, the mother of Jesus, it names Matthew and the beloved disciple, uh, no, it names Matthew and Thomas as coming back to Jerusalem to attend to Mary at her deathbed. And at that time, she's about 80 years old. And it also makes a distinction between two tombs. In Jerusalem itself, Maria was persecuted because she was visiting the place of the crucifixion and the tomb. And at her death, in the end, it has her being taken and placed in a new family tomb, which is consistent with what we see with the Talpia tomb. Uh, so you have Maria and you have two who were named as attending her deathbed at the end of their own lives. And that's Matthew and, uh, yeah, and Thomas, who is probably the one we know as uh, Tiam or as Didymos Judas Thomas, the beloved disciple. And it says he came, he arrived from India. But these are the three people that would be together at the time of Mary's death, including Mary, and we find ossuaries with their names. What do you think? Do you think that Mary Magdalene was Jesus' wife? Uh, well, we may never know for sure, but my feeling is probably not. And uh, I would say, you know, on a 50-50 probability, I'm a little more toward not. Now, I'm not saying 80% probability not, 90% probability not. I would say more like about 52% probability that she was not his wife. And it almost, as Tal Elion put it, to have her as his wife, as in the Da Vinci Code, it sort of diminishes her that... She was not of her own skills and her own brilliance able to lead the congregation, but instead by some kind of inheritance, by marriage. There are some things that you can read in the Gospels, the wedding and so on. And was it a disguised wedding? Because if Jesus was going to be killed, and if it was known that she was married to him, the Romans would have killed her too. So in that uh, case, it's, it's one of those things that I see is really unknown. Other people in the group, they believe more likely that she was married to Jesus. It's rather odd that you would have a Jewish male at that time uh, who is not married. That is unusual. But maybe he was more involved with the Essenes than we know. But he was also involved with the temple. But he was... Like the Essenes, he was a bit antagonistic toward the temple. So in that case, who do you think is the mother of Judas by Jesus? I think he could be an adopted child, a child that was adopted into the family. Several of the apostles adopted children. And in fact, the Catholic Church, uh, for as far back as I know, was always promoting the adoption of orphans. 
the Jesuits especially, they carried that on. And, uh, you know, they about what, about the 1500s, they, they seem to have preserved and kept reading and going through the advanced text. That they were sort of like the rejected scholars of the church. They would be sent into basements and so on was sent into countries that no one ever wanted to go to, and then they would uh, become like those people. Several times the church and the governments had Spain, for example, had to send, and Portugal had to send in armies to kill the Jesuits and those with them. There's actually a very good movie and very historically correct called The Mission. Uh, Jeremy Irons was in it, and Robert De Niro. And that kind of explains that part of history quite well. It gives you a view of the sorts of things that went on. But I know some Jesuits were not at all surprised about this tomb turning up. Some were a little shaken by some of the names that turned up. Uh, they were very annoyed by the idea that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and by hearing things about skeletons and so on. Uh, but some of them, as they looked closer at it, I mean, the first call I got is, uh, are you aware that the patina fingerprint from your tomb is on the Torin Shroud? <laughs> and I'm so sorry. I You'd have to bleep it out. <laughs> I said, you're inking me. <laughs> you know? Word for feces. <laughs> not the thing you normally expect to say to a Jesuit. And I said, I would not believe it until or unless I received evidence that the study had been done and published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal and that it was published before we published our results. And there was, they checked all three of those boxes. And uh, yeah, the talp, the, uh, the one corner of the Torin Shroud that they looked at that on, it uh, has the very beginning of the Terra Rosa phase, the red earth that was just the tomb, whoever went in and took the shrouds, uh, the stone covering was not fitted back into the tomb properly. And with all the rains that came in, the red earth was going in. And before that, we have a series of layers, thinner layers, that's called the appetite period, a uh, mineral called appetite crystallizing and forming. And, you know, the rain is coming, is seeping down into the tomb. So about roughly AD 80, you get a little detection of a sulfur spike, and that would be the dust of the eruption of Vesuvius coming uh, eastward and raining down, coming down with the rain over Jerusalem hills. And uh, you, every chemical stage you can see in this tomb and by the surrounding minerals, every tomb does develop its unique chemical history. And when I was doing developing the patina fingerprinting method at the crime lab, we, I said, okay, let's, and I had uh, Shimon Gibson and Simka and their friends find samples, send, me, send us samples from ossuaries that I wanted to be tinted partly red. And one of them, they knew exactly what tomb it came from tree roots had gone in, the same agricultural soil had gone in. I was being very mean to the ossuaries. I wanted samples from other ossuaries that would most likely match our two. And uh, even then, looking with the most similar chemical history that I could imagine, uh, no other tomb really came close. So. We knew that patina fingerprinting was unique. And when the James ossuary, then we, we had, were sent samples of that, did multiple tests on those. And uh, uh, that was uniquely consistent with the Tapia tomb.
but of course I don't count it with the names. So what 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 does that mean? That a fingerprint that was found uh, on the Jesus ossuaries in the Talpi is in the shot of Turin. What does that mean? Uh, the the first eleven to twelve hundred years or so of the Talpiot tomb uh, patina fingerprint are on a part of the Turin shroud that was sampled, unique up to specific contents of metal in the soil, uh, iron, uh, titanium in the Talpiot tomb, uh, things like that. And what it means is that after about 11 to 1300, 10 to 1300 years or so, someone uh, that the Torin Shroud might be one of the missing shrouds in the Jesus ossuary. It might actually be. And for that, I give up to about a 50% probability that it's one of the missing shrouds from the Jesus ossuary. And it seems to record, it's consistent with recording the first uh, 10, you know, roughly between AD. Uh, 1,012 to 1300 AD, which is consistent with someone went in, it became a sacred site for a while. And when the Templars were being defeated by Saladin and fled Jerusalem, uh, one of the most valuable things that they could think of would have been the uh, shrouds in this ossuary and they were removed and taken. The fibers, the trace fibers we have, they never decayed. They never developed black mold. That is absolutely unique. It's a humid environment. You would expect black mold to be growing on the shroud. Uh, and we would expect to find them on the ossuary fibers. And the shroud of Turin, by the way, it's been through fire. It's been wet with water during a fire. And Ironically, it has never grown black mold either. And the fibers are very supple. Same with the Jesus ossuary. I, def I deliberately left fibers in the mineral incrustations around them and sticking out of the actual original mineral crustaceans, uh, crust incrustations are these very supple fibers. Uh, but if I removed them, for study, I would have been removing the proof that they were ancient. And uh, unless you carbon 14 to them, which would destroy them, so we don't do that. Uh, but yeah, the Torin Shroud might be one of the missing shrouds from the Jesus Ossuary, one of the two that we know of. So, so in other words, you think... It's getting more fascinating. So you and think that far, the... Why are the fibers so well preserved? Well, there was a Roman, common Roman fixing agent uh, called soapwort, derived from a plant. And my hypothesis is that uh, the shrouds were overdosed with soapwort, which uh, actually it's an antimicrobial and uh, it might have, it would have helped to preserve the fibers. And we have this unique situation with the Turin Shroud and with the fibers in the Jesus ossuary. But we can't, they won't let allow, I mean, I'm hoping there'll be another examination allowed of the Turin Shroud. Uh, we have the samples from the Jesus ossuary are too small, so we can't take them apart and examine for specific chemicals with the technology we have right now, 10, 20 years from now, we may have that technology and we can examine non-invasively. And if we see a lot of soap wort there in the Jesus ossuary fibers and we see the same thing in the Torrin Shroud, then that's another thing increasing the probability that uh, it was taken from the Jesus ossuary as uh, the Christians fled Jerusalem. So, in other words, you think the shot of Turin is authentic? Possibly. I would like to see more tests done on it. I would like to see, for example, 
more fibers from the center of the Torin shroud that can be put through carbon-14 testing. We only had one that was left over from the prior test. And also when I was first contacted by a Jesuit and I said, well, wait a minute, what about the carbon-14 test? And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, 13th century or something. And I was asked, well, look at where it was sampled from. We'll send you all the documentation on that. Uh, and, uh, the only corner that Cardinal Pellegrino had allowed, yes, we're distant cousins, but that he had allowed to be sampled for the carbon-14 test. It was this corner that had reweaves, and fortunately, 400 years ago, for example, when they cut out a piece and gave it to the Princess Clothide for a big donation to the church, they, when they rewove it, about every 10th or 15th fiber was dark blue. And that went into the reweave. And uh, even before they did the carbon-14 test, they realized, well, we have to throw out at least two of the little one centimeter squares that we've got here. And, uh, but there were other reweaves in that section and it, the test just shouldn't have been done. It was going to be, you know, uh, really not accurate information material going in and not coming out either. And uh, Pele Cardinal Pellegrino had said near the end of his life when he was asked about that sample. And he said, I did not want people venerating the shroud more than Jesus. So he kind of put one to the scientist. This is all you're going to be allowed to sample from. Ah, it's going to ruin your sample. And they went along with it where they should have just not done the test at all. Now, technology improved and they when they did those tests, they were allowed to, with crime lab sticky tape, take samples of loose fibers on the surface of the shroud. And they had one that was from the center of the shroud. Actually, I think they had two that were one centimeter long. And out at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, well, about 10 years ago, uh, no, more like about 15 years ago, there was a technology that one centimeter is big enough. You don't need a whole square. You can just do with one fiber. And so they ran it through and it wasn't as accurate, but it was accurate within 200 years either way. And it perfectly bracketed the first century AD. And I said to this Jesuit, I said, well, now you've got my curiosity. Uh, if I can have even three more one centimeter long samples from the center section of the Torin Shroud, and they all, all bracket the first century AD by 200 years each way, uh, then you'll really have my attention. <laughs> and I was asked, this was before Pope Francis, and the reply was, well, you know, not until a Jesuit is the uh, Pope. And we laughed and my friend said, uh, yeah, that's so, no, and I had asked him, so yeah, when does hell freeze over? But maybe under this Pope Francis, he'll allow another study. Whatever the results, they're going to be interesting. Let's look at the James ossuary. I know that um, some people think it does come from the Calpia tomb because it contains similar material that's uh, in the tomb. Could you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. The patina fingerprint is exactly 100% consistent. So the whole chemical history of the James ossuary is identical to the Talpia tomb. That should be a slam dunk, but there will always be people criticizing it because it did spend some part of its history on the antiquities market and in a private collector's uh, collection. And so I just, uh, Foyger and I, we were just, no, we don't include it in the equation. Even though Simka was going crazy. I mean, once you add that, it's one in, bill, one in a billion. It has to be, uh, yeah, yeah, but we were mean in every way we could be mean to the Jesus equation. As a matter of fact, uh, the odds were 
of the, this combination of names coming up in Israel because we used all of the names on all of the ossuaries, almost like a phone book directory. How common are these names to come up together? The ones we have, uh, Jerusalem would have had to exist for hundreds of years for this combination of names to come up once. And, uh, well, no, for a little more than a century for it to come up once. And the odds were then one in between one in 60,000 and uh, one in 600,000. And uh, of it being these random names coming together by chance. And so Andre said, just in case there are any, uh, any little things we did not include, things that we still don't know about, we're going to reduce, yeah, it was, uh, we're going to reduce it by a hundred. And then he said, no, make it a thousand. So that's how it came down to one chance in 600. And even one chance in 600, and especially as mean as we were being to the Jesus ossuary assemblage, one in 600 is huge. What do you think about the dispute regarding the inscription on the James Ossuary? About uh, James, the brother, uh, James, son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus. Some people say well, some of it was interpolated. Some people say the whole thing was like inserted. Like four yeah, four. yeah, they say that uh, Golan carved it in, and that's what they accused him of. Uh, this already went through a whole court of law, and in fact. Uh, What's his name? Zias. Yeah, he, he was actually sued for libel and slander for uh, claiming that the things were inscribed and certain things he said about Simca and so on. And uh, he lost that case. And the patina fingerprinting in a court of law held up. Now, Oded Galan had called me near the end. And he said, can you please withhold your statement? Can you please, please not have this patina fingerprinting data uh, presented in court? And I was like, you're facing jail time. And this proves, I mean, proves 100% that you did not call this, that the inscription is ancient. The patina fingerprint is right in the letters. And uh, he was crying on the phone. And then I knew this guy is a real dedicated collector. He would have rather gone to prison and been the, even if he was the only person on earth who knew it was real, and he would have rather gone to prison than to, uh, and still be able to keep the ossuary because our evidence showed we also had the measurements of the uh, James ossuary of the miss there was one ossuary during the excavation that was stolen on uh, the on Saturday uh, while most of the people were away from the tomb it was just picked up and stolen and uh, but it hadn't been photographed but it had been measured the measurements were the same and I went through a whole statistical analysis on that i think it came it wasn't a very uncommon it was actually the most common form uh you know dimensions of an ossuary but it was something in the neighborhood of still only about one in 20 ossuaries would have those dimensions that uh our missing 10th ossuary had and it was completely consistent with the james ossuary uh, but Golan, it tells me, you know, he knew it was real and he would have rather gone to jail than lose it. And in the end, even though uh, you see the law in Israel was any ossuary recovered after I think it's 1978 uh, belonged to the Israeli Antiquities Authority. If the ossuary were recovered before 1978, it belonged to whoever owned it. 
and the tomb was discovered in 1980. There was an excavation of several days, and then the tomb was completely sealed, and they continued to build the condominium over it. It was thought to be lost, but the religious authorities went in, did their own study and their own measurements of the tomb and wrote their own private papers. And then the plans, it became a lost tomb because the plans were revised by the architect under the religious authorities. And they made a very small uh, wall and built, uh, made sure that the tomb had a spirit shaft and they built a rose garden over this empty tomb. So, uh, you know, the religious authorities took this tomb more seriously than most tombs and the adjoining tombs, they took it more seriously than most people do at that time, back in 1980. And it was quite a surprise to find the tomb was still there. Let's take a look at this slide here. Um, All right, one second. Why am I getting a, a an article in the research? Okay, this comes. This image comes from an article on the ResearchGate website. Uh, I'm getting a low battery warning here, John. Okay, this is the last slide. Uh, uh, I'll go the, to uh, the authors of the authors of the, of the article I'm talking about is uh, Arya Urban, Shimon, Moshi, Shiraz, Ludwig, Halases. I hope I pronounced those names right. Uh, yeah, I have to replace, uh, try another plug. So, um, okay, good. Yeah, I know some people in the chat are saying the audio is coming across strange. There's, uh, yeah, your audio is coming. Not, not a lot that I can do about it. I mean, I, uh, and also Charles, uh, you had some static uh, when when you speak. Yeah, it's okay. Like, we'll just have to. It's okay have to when I'm speaking. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, the people to people appear hearing. to be people people are people are understanding us anyway. They they understood us, so it, it's fine. Okay, so the ossuaries included here, Mary, Jesus, son of Joseph, Judah, son of Jesus, Jose, or Jose, Joseph, the brother of Jesus. Right, oh, Mary okay. of which Mariani, is actually, Jose Matthew. is very interesting because that's a unique nickname. And of course, in a family where you have two Josephs, you know, it's like we had Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Younger, and uh, Jose was the Younger. And it's a very unique nickname. Oh, did I just lose you? No, you did not. Uh, so, um, final question. Oh, and by the way, in the equation, we counted Yossi as only another Joseph. Okay. And we counted so Maria as just another Mary. We didn't say, oh, that's a unique Latinized into Aramaic. We counted it as just another Mary. Okay. That's so another thing that we did when we were being mean to the Jesus equation. So you don't think that, uh, do you think that Jos is Joseph, the brother of Jesus in the Gospels? Uh, yeah, I think that's okay. what it would be. And that, that would be Joseph's son, possibly by a prior marriage. That he was a widower and then he married and married Mary. So of all these names here, my final question is, there is no tomb that comes even close to this. No, no. Hmm. There's another tomb. In fact, there was no controversy over it. Siren of Cyrene. And it was like, oh, that's who we found. <laughs> You know, the mathematics were much less certain, but of course it is unique. And it probably was the same uh, Simon of Cyrene who is written about helping Jesus carry the cross. Hmm. And interestingly, there was never any heated controversy about that. I think the controversy arose 
from too many people uh, because the Da Vinci Code had come out and, uh, you know, too many people uh, up on the Da Vinci Code, which, frankly, I, yeah, I kind of like the movie and everything, but when it gets to the acts of Philip, it misquotes them in both the novel and the movie. That's not really what the what the passage mm. they're quoting says. Well, thanks for joining me, Charles. It's been uh, a wonderful stream. Uh, despite some of the technical difficulties earlier, we got through it. Yeah, but uh, I do kind of feel it would have been less controversial if it weren't for the Da Vinci Code associations that automatically came into people's heads. And of course, finding a name Judas, son of Jesus, would be confusing unless you've read all the text carefully. Uh, you, you've gone into the Gospels and uh, seen, oh, Didymos called Judas, uh, Thomas called Judas. Oh, they're the same person. So mm -hmm. that's pretty fascinating. Well, thanks for joining me again. Thank you. See you later. Take care. You too. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream.